Good afternoon, my name is Evelina Kachenko, and today I'm visiting my grandfather, a famous artist and illustrator, Oleg Rybchenko. Grandpa, I want to talk to you about your passion about many years of work on the illustrations for Alice in Wonderland, and more recently for the second story about Alice, Through the Looking Glass, and what Alice found there. My first question may seem trivial. Probably many people, if not everybody, asked you about that. Why the word Alice? Why not any other story? What is so special about it that attracts you and other illustrators? For many artists, illustrating Alice becomes, so to speak, a mandatory program or a test or a challenge. Yeah, we are talking about those crazy enthusiasts, including me, who are working on Alice's topic by the pure interest and on their own expense. And this is not only about illustrations, but paintings, graphics, etc. Illustrators on commission is another story, and they have other reasons. Generally, I'd narrowed this question to my and only obsession with Alice, not talking on behalf of other artists. Why Alice? I could say I just love this book and love is blind. However, after such a long period of time, this explanation does not work. Certainly, there is some attractiveness, some magic in this book, which catches you and don't let you go. And it is not only in Alice's transformations or strange creatures she meets on her way what is pretty usual for many fairy tales, but more in a way of Alice's thinking, her perception of the world. This side of story attracts me the most. There is no evil to fight in this story. There is no mission to complete. There is nobody to, to save. This story doesn't teach any morals like be honest or good is always defeats evil. Instead, it shows us how to think philosophically, teaches us to ask the right questions, to distinguish between big and small, not in terms of their size, but rather in terms of value. Alice helps us to realize that there is a very thin line between important and unimportant in this world. The story is full of paradoxes and rich in tasty visual material. When I started draw sketches, drawings about this story, then I just could not stop. It became an occupation, a kind of hobby, a favorite pastime. And at some point I realized that all this madness must be stopped. So I collected all the graphic stuff, translated it into a series of one style illustrations for a book and published it. When I first read the Alice, and even then, I had the feeling that it is not like other fairy tales. For example, at the end no one gets married and lives happily after, but not only a theme or a plot, but something else, as if it is not a fairy tale at all. Alice just wakes up and that's it. It turns out it was only a dream. 
help me um, explain whether this is so or what is the difference. The Hill of Hellis was born as an improvisation, a kind of revelation, and a very specific event, boat trip on the river, and was told for a very special company, Hellis Lidl and her sisters. Hellis Lidl, daughter of Henry George Lidl, dean of Christ Church at Oxford, the college where Mr. Dawson, Lewis Carroll, taught math. She was Alice's prototype. And she was a real person, and it was she who asked Carol to tell the fairy tale and make it silly. Lewis Carroll really stepped way outside the traditional fairy tale structure. At the time he wrote Alice, he was not what we call a professional writer. He was professor of math, and as a good educated gentleman, had pretty good writing skills. And let's not forget that... Good! This is very interesting indeed. But I'd rather talk about the fairy tale without going beyond the limits of the fairy tale itself. Because the biography of the author, his personality is kind of secondary information. You mean like when listening music, listen to the music, not the biography of composer? Yes! Let's get some answers based on the plot and the internal mechanism of the tale without referring to the author's biography. Well, in many fairy tales that we used to, the hero, main character, has a goal, the task to accomplish. In our story, the protagonist, Alice, doesn't complete any mission, doesn't have a goal. Well, at the beginning, there is a kind of goal, to catch up with the white rabbit, but when she was almost there, it was not interesting for her anymore. She wants to get into a wonderful garden, but we hardly could name it a mission. Then, on the way, she faces strange ecological circumstances, creatures, but what is her way? Where it is leading her? She's acting not like an adventurer in chase for a treasure, but rather like a visitor in an amusement park. Some call Alice a philosophical tale. I'd rather agree with them. According to Heidegger, the essence of philosophy is asking. Asking the world by human and asking human by the world. When a writer writes a novel, he or she's trying to get used to the characters. Sometimes even turns into the personage. You mean like this? Or like that? Or even like that? Oh, not literally, but in a way. How does it work for the illustrator? Good question. Does it need to drop into a character role? And in what degree? Sometimes trying on a character, fitting the role on yourself helps illustrator. Sometimes, on the contrary, abstracts. Simplifying the situation. Writer describes character from inside, illustrator from outside. Of course, it's always better to understand character's motives, temper, behavior. But I have to pay more attention to the outer appearance. That's why a proper description of the character's appearance is much more important for me as an illustrator than Tons of diamonds. The first story, Alice in Wonderland, and the second story, Looking Glass. What are their similarities, and what are their differences? You want to hear a short or long version? Oh, as long as possible, please. But not boring. <laughs> Good, let's find some differences. As I've told you before, Tale of Alice was born as an improvisation. And this is right for the Alice in Wonderland, first book. There was a lot of later rewriting, adding, editing, etc. But the fact remains, initially the story was a burst of improvisation. When Alice dropped into a magic world for the first time, she seemed to be waiting for adventure. 
Remember how she was bored on the bank of the river, and with what passion she rushed after White Rabbit. Yes, she was ready for adventures. She desired them. But she was hardly prepared for them. Everything was new, unexpected, and getting curiouser and curiouser. Looking Glass is the next story. Here Alice is already an experienced explorer. She reasons looking into the mirror. Is there the room behind it? And is it identical to the one I'm in? And she enters this room through the mirror. With interest, indeed. But without the sensation. Another difference is in the plot. In the inner structure of the story. The journey is more logical. Room downstairs, out through the door, into the garden. Then she appears on a huge chess desk and has to follow the moves which are already predetermined, unlike the Wonderland, where everything is unpredictable. My next question is about the differences between two books. I mean, two editions with your illustrations, Alice in Wonderland, you published about 10 years ago, and The Looking Glass, The One is Coming. Are they similar or different in terms of illustrations and design? About the difference between two books in terms of illustrations, design and print quality? No, there won't be any difference. Illustrations are ready and they are drawn in the same manner in technique, composition and in terms of interaction with the text on the page. The design of the book, conceptually and in detail, follows the first book as a model. Looking glass will be printed in the same way as the Wonderland. A very expensive way, I have to say. But we are going to collect funds through the crowdfunding campaign. Uh, in Alice in Wonderland, with Alice, all the time there are some changes, transformations, she either becomes big or small, but in the looking glass, I didn't notice any of that. It seems that in the looking glass, there are no such transformations at all. Well, how about talking to flowers and to meeting the chess queen a bit taller than her? Or well, talk to an egg, she confused with a man. Have you ever seen a bug? who is sitting on a carriage bench like an ordinary gentleman, besides the horse, by the way. Of course, in these examples not she. The creatures she meets are exposed to changes in growth, but everything is related. If your companion has become higher, you become lower, and vice versa. I always imagine Talking flowers the same height as Alice. Chess figures she meets in a looking glass room already are bigger than usual to make it possible for Alice to, to lead King's pencil. Then they become just the usual height for ordinary adults. Or maybe Alice have shrunk. So, there are some transformations in Looking Glass, only they don't bother Alice as much in the, as in the first story. When she appears in the Looking Glass land, Alice is already an experienced adventurer. Only this time, she is surprised by other surprises. After the release of the second part of Alice's Adventures, Carl, for some reasons, did not continue to write about her. On the contrary, he wrote two books about Sylvie and Bruno, one after another. Why? Why didn't he continue to write about Alice? By the way, Bruno's Revenge was published in one children magazine right after Alice in Wonderland and before The Looking Glass. So we see the idea of Sylvia and Bruna appeared quite early, and Lewis Carroll considered it to be his most important work. So we have to be grateful to Carroll 
that he did not switch completely to Silvio and Bruno, but rode looking glass instead. I guess Silvio and Bruno is a very interesting novel and remains still very underestimated. As for me, <laughs> I'd give both volumes for one more Alice. Your illustrations are made in a peculiar manner, as a combination of black and white pattern and sepia drawing. How did you come to this particular style, and is there a literary meaning in this combination besides purely visual originality? Good question. And pretty easy one for me. Because, yes, I really put a certain meaning in this kind of composition. Story of Alice, in addition to the scenes that the characters play in, has plenty of dialogues, verses, thoughts, self-reflections, etc. And I've decided to visualize those invisible, unseen things. Main part of the drawing, made in sepia, is the actual illustration to the current scene, to what the text is all about, this particular page. And it is covered with, this, with a thin layer of watercolor, adding some kind of atmosphere, a sense of presence. Altogether, this should remind the charm of vintage photos. A frame, or a kind of curtain, drawn in black and white, around the main picture, is intended to convey Alice's conversations, thoughts or memories, dialogues, poems, etc. And about originality. It is not a separate quality to which illustrator should strive. Illustration's originality will sprout itself if it exists in you. So, what audience is Alice intended for? Who are its potential readers? Yes, I understand. This question is more likely to Lewis Carroll. Therefore, I will clarify this question. Who are the potential buyers of Alice with your illustrations? Well, it is really the question to Lewis Carroll. But at the same time to me too. Because in terms of buying, selling, I don't distinguish myself, my illustrations from the text. As I understand the role of illustrator, to be as close to content as possible. As more accurate illustrations are and closer to the text, the easier for reader to get better understanding of the story. As for the audience, I understand this, is, this story is about children's journey into the world of adults. In fact, all these creatures Alice meets on her way. Are they happy to meet her? They are all busy with something, and Alice is just somebody or even something that bothers them, that seems to be an annoying misunderstanding from which they must get rid of. Adults are filled to the top with cliches, well established opinions, definitions, and prejudices, all which is called common sense. And Alice, with her childish and in fact logically correctly formulated questions, destroys their usual and comfortable view of the world order. So this book is for children, or is it written on the cover of one of, one of my books for young at heart, regardless of their biological age. And how long have you been working on illustrations? How long does it take you to draw one? It's always difficult to answer such a question. But due to the fact that my work on the book, to put it mildly, has dragged on, the question is quite natural. By the time I began working on the book, I had accumulated quite a lot of sketches, compositions, portraits of characters, etc. I cannot count how much time was spent on all this. Therefore, I can talk more definitely only about working on the final stage when implementing 
of the illustrations into the material. I guess it takes from two days to a week for one illustration. Considering that I drew an illustration for two pages per sheet at once, it took me from the several months to a year. As per looking glass, it took me much longer because the book itself is bigger like by one third. Um, and there is a gap between the publications of the first book with your illustrations and the second. A rather long one, 10 years. Why didn't you start working the second right after the first one? Actually, I did. There was a lot of sketches and preliminary drawings made to that time for both books. So I just kept going with the next story of Alice. Once, at some point, I realized that fatigue after working on the first book prevents me from moving forward. I was tired, and not only from drawing illustrations, but from all these uh, troubles with publishing, printing, with all this uh, publishing process. So I decided to make a break and switch temporarily to to the other projects. I have illustrated and published The Hunting of the Snark and the collection of nursery rhymes Humpty Dumpty and Fred. These projects distracted me from Alice and they took some time. So when completing them, I felt myself ready to return to Looking Glass. Okay, so this is a question for you. Uh, when did you first read Alice? Or did your parents read it to you as a bad time story? It happened for various reasons that I read this book for the first time being already a student of the university. Earlier in my school years, I was pleased to get acquainted with the symbolic logic of her. So when reading at least for the first time I was prepared for the logical problems and paradoxes this book is full of. As for how children perceive this book, I cannot judge from my personal experience, except the feeling that each time I read this book, or even part of it, I'm turning into the key. Yes, this is very interesting, and we could talk about Alice for hours, but our viewers will probably get bored, so we have to wrap this up, and thank you so much for watching us. And thank you, Granddad, for answering our questions.